Hello and welcome to Trust TV News Hour. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. On the news tonight, fire raises down 50 makeshift rooms in Potakot community. NCDC faces probe over spendings of 9 billion Naira COVID 19 response intervention funds. Spain bound passenger arrested with 96 wraps of illicit drugs at Abuja airport. And on the foreign scene, several injured as military ram into protesters in Myanmar's Yangon city. Now the news in detail. Another fire has raised down a makeshift settlement at Rumukalagbo, a community in Portakot City Council late Saturday evening, with over 50 rooms affected and properties worth millions destroyed. Correspondent who visited the scene of the fire incident now reports. The affected residents say the fire began from a stove suspected to be filled with adulterated kerosene called Boar Fire, where a boy is making Indomie around 7 p.m. on Saturday evening. They lamented that the fire burned all their properties. One of the landlords of the affected tenant, Silva Lin Kalabo, and some other victims gave details about the incident. They said that one boy is cooking Indomie. Why the sister is sick, lying on the ground, kicked the stove. The thing hit at the something of uh, carton. That's how the fire started. They called me. I should come that my bachelor is catching fire. I say, how can? I say, let me not just go immediately because people are here. They have already called me. It's outside people that are calling me. Before I pay the attention, it's one of my brothers. He said, just left. Call me. It's true. I should come. Now come down this place. There is nothing I see in this place, nothing left, nothing keep, nothing. There is nothing. People, property, everything. All my bacha, almost 50 bacha is here. All is damaged. I came back late. I wasn't around that very moment, but when I came back late, I saw the incident happen. The thing was very, very tough. Well, 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 well. So by the time we tried to quench the fire, the thing was exploding like that. He said it's a one small boy that light up the light from their house. So before then we come, the fire has exploded everywhere. So I don't have too much time to because the fire has burned all our house. Nothing where we come out here, nothing where we have done, where we don't come out for this place. So even you can see the thing burned almost about about forty something rooms here. This is the so I come out from work. Because my son was six the day before yesterday night. So I just come out from work that is they sent me go and rush and buy some drugs for my son for chemist. So after coming back from the buying the drugs for a chemist, I saw at the front here I see the lights. So I went run down to the place. I see some people packing some things. So they all run me come to come and pick some of my things here. Why the fire always catch my house? So I run house, I run MC, nothing I pick to the house, nothing, nothing, even pin. I don't pick anything to my house. So that is only my body I pick. So I don't know where to go, know what I got to start from. The victims condemned the slow response of fire service and called on government to come to their aid as all properties burnt down, including a church. I have to stay government. If God will touch them, they should help us to make this place to be as it's before and to help the poor. Because I know many of them don't have destination to go. I know how I'm managing with them. Even the pain of the rent is war. I'm even having pity more than myself for them. I know how they're managing. It's not easy for them. And they do not have anything from inside their house. Everything is damaged. Nothing is ordinary ground. So fire service come, come later. That was after 10, Abby, if I'm not mistaken. By that time, the fire have already done whatever I want to do. Everything, 9.30. If government can put on their hand and find something for the for us for here, so that we can help ourselves, because there's no way see the population of people. Even yesterday, we sleep outside. So many people sleep here outside. And so many people lost their property, lost their everything. Nothing that you can see here. So if I thought they can help us here, and at least we can start our life afresh again, you understand? So that's what I'm begging even if it is government or individual or if they can render even clothes for people that doesn't care clothes or even food can bring it because as it is now 
they are hopeless. They don't know where to go. Recall that several fire incidents have happened in River State within two weeks as a result of illegal petroleum product, popularly called Boar Fire. Four people have been killed and scores injured in Dugara, Daurawa and Gidangadi villages of Matazu local government area of Katsuba State. This is coming in spite of all security measures adopted to restore peace in Katsuna State. Trust TV News correspondent Abdullahi Ismail Amadi in Katsuna tells us more. According to one Ibrahim Usman, a resident of Eric area village in Musa local government, just a turn through from the affected villages, he told Trust Television that uh, the bandits came in large number and started shooting sporadically on the villagers and of course they rustled several animals, wounded several people and uh, they forced so many people out of the villages. As at the time he was reporting the issue to Trust Television, he said several women and children have fled the villages to neighboring towns and cities across the state. When contacted for comment, Police Public Relations Officer of Kasuna State Police Command, SP Gamboisa, said they are yet to receive any information about the attack and uh, as soon as they get the information, they will make it public. However, uh, Trust Television gathered that uh, the villagers who fled uh, the affected uh, areas are now taking refuge in Malumfaishi, Musawa and Matazu towns. From Katana, Abdullahi is my mother reporting for Trust Television. And about 60 kidnapped victims, including those abducted at Emmanuel Baptist Church, Kakaudaji, Chikun local government area of Kaduna State, have been united with their families. The victims were brought to Albaka Baptist Church when were accompanied by security agents. It was a moment of mixed feelings for relations who came to reunite with the victims. Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, said the rescued victims include those abducted along Kaduna Kacha Road and Emmanuel Baptist Church, Kakaudaji. <laughs> The military authorities reach out to Kaduna State Government that they have with them over 60 citizens who were kidnapped in different locations. They want Kaduna State Government to take possession of these citizens. And government collected these people and we handed them over to the leadership of Kaduna Baptist Conference. And there are other citizens who relations were here. We equally uh, do the same thing. That is what uh, we did. But uh, from what we can see, uh, they are largely uh, victims of uh, kidnapping that uh, took place at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Kakaudaji, in Chukun local government. And there are other citizens who were kidnapped along the Kaduna uh, Kachia road. I think in summary, uh, this is it. It is not certain how much was paid for ransom to secure their release. We recall that 65 worshippers were abducted during a Sunday service by bandits on the 30th of October 2021. Meanwhile, House of Representatives Committee on Public Accounts has summoned the Director General of the Center for Disease Control, NCDC, Dr. Ifidayo Adetifa, over alleged payment of a part of 9 billion federal government's COVID-19 response intervention through the personal accounts of some of its staff. The committee summoned the Director General over the weekend based on an audit query by the Office of the Auditor General of the Federation to give account of the agency's spending on COVID-19. In 2020 and 2021, the chairman of the committee, Oluwele Oke, said records show that the NCDC got 620 million naira for March to December 2020, 5 billion naira for March 2020 to March 2021, and 3.49 billion naira from January to September 2021 from the federal government to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. OK said from the documents and other submissions by the agency, parts of the money were paid into private accounts of some of its staff, which he said was against the procurement laws of Nigeria. The committee therefore demands the agency to present all relevant records on how the funds were expended at the next sitting of the committee. Similarly, officials of Julius Berger in Algeria, Cetraco and some other construction firms appeared before the committee over alleged tax evasion. 
Operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, have arrested a 44-year-old father of three, Gabriel Anthony Patrick, for ingesting 96 pellets of cocaine at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja. Spokesman of the agency, Femi Baba Femi, said on Sunday in Abuja that Gabriel, a native of Nike in Enugu North, local government area of Enugu State, was arrested on Friday, 26 November, during an outward clearance of Turkish airline at the boarding screening area of the airport en route Abuja, Istanbul, Madrid. In the same vein, NDLE operatives at the Mutala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, have arrested one Okori Godwin over his attempt to export 21.85 kilograms of cannabis concealed in foodstuff to London. Meanwhile, five students of the American University of Nigeria, AUN, Yola Adamawa State, and the University of Meduguri, Borno State, are among suspects arrested for drug offences in raids across nine states in the last week. Right now, we're being joined by the Director, Media and Publicity, National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, Femi Baba Femi, on the arrests at entry and exit points around the country. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. All right. So we have had reports and we've been getting reports of um, lots of arrests being made um, for, uh, of suspected traffickers. And when this happens, a lot of splash is created in the media. But um, we haven't yet heard of any prosecutions being made. So we want to follow up. And what is your follow-up strategy after these arrests to ensure that your work is not undone? No, no, we, the, 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 when we arrest... We complete the process of investigation, hand over the case file to our uh, directorate of legal services, who charge suspects to court. There is none of our suspects, especially those um, involved in trafficking, that are not taken to court. And I believe periodically we do release statements on, um, on the prosecution and in some cases uh, the conviction. I want to assure you that we have about 90% conviction rate in all our cases. So we do have um, a number of convictions. We do have, um, we, we engage take virtually um, all our established cases to court is where they end. And um, uh, according to our statistics, as I speak with you, so far this year, we've um, arrested over 3,000, I mean, over 10,355 um, suspects out of which we have charged more than five thousand to court and as i speak with you over a thousand of them having jail terms across um, um the correctional centers and um over three thousand um, others are ongoing the trial i mean we have um, more than three thousand others ongoing in the various courts so we do i mean we most of our cases end up in court it's only when we have some issues that have to do, I mean, some cases that have to do with uh, drug users, some of who are victims, so rather actually compounding their case by taking them, throwing them in jail, we do take them in for counseling and rehabilitation, just to have a, I mean, a fair balance between our drug demand um, reduction, our drug supply reduction uh, efforts. All right. well, within the same period, okay. those are quite impressive. Within numbers the there. same period, yeah. Okay, go on. Okay, within this same period, talking about our drug demand um, reduction effort, within this this same period, we've had um, about five thousand five hundred and seventy-nine um, persons cancelled and rehabilitated. I just needed to balance the figure for you to, so that you. Uh, they can be properly uh, put in contest. All right. So those, those are quite impressive numbers, as I alluded to earlier. So um, most of these arrests that we actually have are on the points of entry and exit for suspected traffickers. Um, what efforts are being made on local distribution? Because that is also a problem. If these traffickers don't have a market, then they won't bring these drugs in. So what are we doing about local distribution? Uh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You also see that um, beyond arresting them at um, the airports, seaports, land borders, 
We also um, carry out raids across um, um, black spot drug joints across the country just to make sure that we mop up those that um, the drugs that were able to escape to the streets. And beyond that, we also believe in the strategy that we have to go to the, to the source, the pipelines, and shut them down. And that is why I mean going into the forest, deep into the forest, to make sure that um, cannabis farms running into hundreds and thousands of hectares are raised down, destroyed totally, just to make sure that we don't allow these things to get into, um, in, into the streets, into our communities, because when they are not available, then um, nobody will look for them, nobody will be able to um, demand for them. We also believe that when we also um, take care of those who use drugs, when there is no demand for it, there will be no market for it. And at the same time, we also what we are doing, a, a gram seized or taken whether at the seaport, at the airport, at the land borders or in the forest or on the streets is a gram less what is available there for users. So where, whichever way they go, whichever way you may think of it, um, I believe we're, we're trying to encircle the cartels and make sure that um, they, they, they don't have it easy at all. And that's exactly the feedback we're getting now because um, quite a number of them are running into here and um, we try the best we can to make sure that um, we, 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 we totally bring down their businesses, their criminal uh, traits. And that's exactly what is happening. If um, you put into consideration uh, the seizure of uh, more than 3.1 million kilograms of assorted illicit drugs in just um, 11 months in th this year alone, that is huge. Uh, probably more than um, uh, the combination nation three years has uh, passed. So that's exactly where we're doing now. We believe that the heat is on the cut at the moment. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Femi Baba Femi, for your time and for those insights. Thank you for having me. All right. Mr. Femi Baba Femi is the Director of Media and Publicity, National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. And he just gave us an insight into the arrests and, of course, some moves being made on prosecution and, of course, distribution of illicit drugs in the country. You're still watching Trust TV News Hour. Coming up after the break. Reminiscing the good old days. Do stay with us. updates on current topical issues and breaking news by downloading the Trust TV mobile app on your Android devices. Go online, click Google Play Store, search Trust TV, install the app and get doses of unfiltered information on happenings all over the world in your pocket. Trust TV, documenting the Nigerian story. Nigerian story. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. 
Now, a look at some of our top stories. 50 makeshift rooms and properties worth millions of naira destroyed in another fire outbreak in Portakot community. And House of Representatives Committee on Public Accounts has summoned the Director General of the NCDC over spendings of 9 billion naira COVID-19 response intervention fund. And moving on to other news, University of Abuja says it's investigating over 10 cases of sexual harassment which have been transferred to its disciplinary committee. Pro-Chancellor and Chairman Governing Council of University of Abuja, Modibo Mohammed, said this at the weekend during a retreat organized for the university's principal officers, deans, directors and trade unions with the theme, Navigating Myriad of Challenges in Managing Universities in Today's World. Speaking on sexual harassment in the university system over the cases of such had been transferred to the university disciplinary committee, adding that persons found guilty would be brought to book and will henceforth be sanctioned accordingly. Modibo said the institution has mounted 24-hour security surveillance within the campus and other sensitive positions to check kidnapping and other security challenges, adding that they have engaged the services of hunters and vigilantes to boost security following a recent incident of abduction of some staff and family members by bandits. The Department of State Services, DSS, has arrested Managing Director of Kano State Consumer Protection Council, KCPC, General Idris Bella Dumbazo retired over allegations of economic sabotage. Dumbazo is arrested for allegedly sealing off seven filling stations in the state capital, an act the secret police says is unilateral and unconstitutional. Daily Trust reports that Dumbazo had sealed seven filling stations and the constitution is against that act as he did not inform the Department for Petroleum Resources. He has been charged with the offence of the economic sabotage with the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He is billed to be charged to court on Monday. Governor Abdullahi Umar Ganduji appointed General Dumbazo retired as the managing director of the council in September 2021. Meanwhile, workers in Kaduna are concerned over non-payment of salaries for more than half of the workforce in the state. The state chapter of the Trade Union Congress raised the alarm in Kaduna on Saturday. TUC Chairman Abdullahi Amfulani told newsmen that over half of the public servants have not been paid for two months. At this time of economic hardship, this development is coming at a time when over 200 teachers are said to be disengaged from the service over certificate forgery. Not assess their salaries and wages for two months now. That is to say October and November 2021, to be precise. The problems and challenges that our team members are being faced with as a result of this, non-payment of salaries of over 20,000 workers of the state since the month of October. What transpired is why it was about 20,000 because that of October were there, some were omitted in November. And we are still working on them that almost more than half of those people have uploaded their, their, their details at the government portal. And this very screen exercise that actually was, that was embarked by the state, that is being embarked by the state government, it affected almost 10,000 of our members. So out of the 20,000 that we are even talking about, about half is from the secondary schools. So most of our members have not been paid. An unidentified woman is currently receiving medical attention at the Mararaba Medical Center for about three months after being unconscious and could not speak nor identify herself. This is happening amidst concern about the state of health services in hospitals across the federal capital territory, Abuja. Chijoki Okafo tells us more. Despite the various reforms to increase the provision of health to the Nigerian people, health access is only 43.3%. Political instability, corruption, limited institutional capacity and an unstable economy are major factors responsible for the poor development of health services in Nigeria. We visited the Mararaba Medical Center to have a better understanding of what health care services look like in the hospital, but we were denied free access to film anything or have interviews with anyone. However, from what our eyes and hidden cameras could catch, most of the patients there were women and children, and since we couldn't speak to any of them, 
It is still unclear whether healthcare services are up to standard here. After much persuasion, we were allowed access into the female ward, a somewhat darkly lit room with patients lined up across both sides of the wall. This woman has been in this hospital for three months. Health staff at the facility say she was brought in unconscious and has since been unable to speak or identify herself. Um, the person you are seeing here, we too, we don't know her name. She was brought unconscious from uh, somewhere, primary health care, and then we started treating her. And God help us, she's recovering. More than two months now. You know, I told you she was unconscious. She became conscious now. And up to now, she cannot talk well. We ask her questions. She cannot tell us where, what is her name, where she comes from. The head nurse at the medical center says since the woman was brought in, they have been the ones taking care of her medical issues and feeding her. This also takes us back to several unreported cases of unidentified missing people. This is just one out of many similar cases and often it ends tragically. Uh, people have been helping and you know it's not all that they can do. We will need, well, sometimes we will need a, a something for her. They may not be around so we now place her on under indigence. The hospital authority have been taking care, I mean, uh, providing some things to take care of her. The Nigerian healthcare system is poorly developed. No adequate and functional surveillance systems are developed to achieve success in healthcare in this modern era. A system well grounded in routine surveillance and medical intelligence as the backbone of the health sector is necessary. Besides adequate management, coupled with strong leadership principles. Chijoki Okafo. Trust TV News, Abuja. Chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum and Governor of Ikiti State, Kayode Fayemi, says to achieve stable democratic governance and national integration, the exemplary leadership style of late Malang Amina Kanu, who laid a solid foundation for good governance and national cohesion during his lifetime, should be emulated. He said this at the 21st anniversary of Mubaya House, held in Kadu State. Trust TV's correspondent, Idris Jibril, now reports. It is the 21st anniversary of Amini Kano Center for Democratic Studies, Mumbai House. And these politicians, educationists, religious and community leaders are all here to pay tribute to the late Kano's politician. The aim of the program focuses on democracy, good governance, and the question of national integration, which is said to be the main areas of late Aminu Kanu's concern during his lifetime. According to Governor Faimi, Malam Aminu Kanu has over his lifetime maintained a policy of good governance and national integration despite the Nigeria's political division. We can borrow a leaf from the late Malam Aminu Kanu and resolve that as part and parcel of the bargain of being a citizen of Nigeria. We will strive to design universal social policies that will enable the generality of our people to renew their faith in the country and their government. Universal access to education should be accompanied by a system of universal health care. It should be underpinned with a national strategy that defines employment creation as a priority concern of public policy enhanced efforts at boosting domestic resource mobilization will need to be accompanied by deliberate measures at redistribution designed to reduce wealth income gender and intergenerational inequalities in order to ensure good governance and national integration there is the need for a collaborative effort to not only emulate but also put into action the teachings and guidance of malam amini kanu through ensuring prosperity by keeping tribes and religious differences aside. As a country, we have continued to invest in improving our democratic, democratic process and systems to ensure the votes of our citizens truly count. So sometimes we Nigerians do not give ourselves enough credit for the successes we have achieved from 1999 to date. As I look around this room, I'm very happy to see people from different political parties and different parts of the country 
What makes me prouder is despite our political, tribal, our religious differences, we are all friends. We are all brothers and we are all strong believers in settling our differences through ballot, not violence. To continue sustaining Mumbaiya House in Kanu is to continue paying tribute to the very many achievements of Malam Amin Kanu, not only in areas of democracy and good governance, but in all aspects of human life. Idris Jibrin, Trust TV News, Kanu. You're watching Trust TV News Hour. The news continues after this short break. Welcome back. And to business news now, where the Nigerian Port Authority says deliberate measures and investments are being undertaken to create a fully digital ecosystem in all the country's ports location by 2025. Acting Managing Director of MPA, Mohamed Bello Koko, disclosed this in a statement signed by Mr. Ibrahim Nasuru, Assistant General Manager, Corporate and Strategic Communications, MPA, at the weekend in Lagos. Belokoko made this known while giving a presentation on MPA's digitalization roadmap and current information and communication technology implementation status at the 41st Ports Management Association of West and Central Africa PMAWCA Annual Council Meeting and 16th Roundtable Conference of Managing Directors of PMAWCA in Douala, Cameroon. The managing director informed the delegates that a lot of work had gone into smart port transformation agenda of the authority, aimed at enthronement of a paperless, time-saving and cost-efficient port operation. Earlier, President of the PMAWCA and Director General of Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, Michael Leguje, described the conference theme, Digitize Ports as Model Port Efficiency, as very relevant. 
Liguji noted that it is relevant because more than ever, COVID-19 had indeed taught everyone that we live in a fragile world. Meanwhile, air travelers in Nigeria say air travel has become an extreme sport as they contend with high costs of ticket fares, delays and often outright cancellation. Some Nigerian travelers speak to Trust TV's Nafisa Abdul Al on the experience, especially as the Ulitai season sets in. The report. With the fast approaching Ulitai season, the cost of flight tickets are beginning to skyrocket and it's telling on travelers. We are now here at the Inamdi Azikiwe International Airport to speak with some of these passengers on this development. Well, we have had a lot of uh, high traffic uh, for about two weeks now. Uh, this should be the consequence of the insecurity along the, the road. And based on that, it becomes an opportunity for the airline to hike their price. So we have a lot of other new aircraft that are just coming. Ordinarily, when new aircraft come, price tends to go down because of competition. But now, whether you are coming, even if you come with more new air, now the price is as high as 100,000, 90,000. My experience was horrible. Coming from Lagos to Abuja, I paid 29,700. Now I'm going back to Abuja from Abuja to Lagos. I don't know why I should pay 49,000. That's exploitation. I don't know. The reason I don't know, you know, and upon that, it got to be delayed. And sometimes the flight gets cancelled. Today is a very, very bad day for me because um, on getting here, I missed my flight 30 minutes before the flight time. It's actually supposed to be for 45 minutes, but it was actually man made because at the airport toll gate, to get into to, to the toll gate, you, we spent about 45 minutes there. So on getting here, nobody considered us. We were more than 25 people who missed their flight on Ibom Airways today. And that's very wrong. I think, um, for example, if you want us to, if you have reasons to delay your flights, you give us your reasons, probably weather condition and all that. But hereby, I wasn't going to miss my flight, if not for the toll gates, what happened at the toll gates. So somehow it's not a coincidence that more than 25 people missed their flight in a particular flight today. Well, it's a great experience to me. I'm surprised uh, even for me to get ticket. I've been hanging here for more than two hours. And I'm surprised the ticket the price is higher. And uh, of course, it's a big challenge to me. I've been hanging here in airport for more than five hours, waiting uh, if there will be a chance for me. And of course, I'm surprised I said that uh, this country is supposed to also look at what is going on now. Many co uh, customers, I think, uh, is hanging here. Increments in the cost of flight tickets, delayed flights, miscommunication between some of these airlines and their passengers are some of the concerns these travelers face on the daily, but more so now in this Yuletide season. They urge the government to enforce some sort of regulation in order to curb this menace. Efforts to get comments of airline operators were, however, not successful. Nafisa Abdel Al, Trust TV News, Abuja. Former Director General of the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Chijoke Ekechuku, says the free fall of the Naira should not be blamed on poor monetary policy of the Central Bank of Nigeria alone. He said that other institutions of government are partially responsible responsible for the apparent collapse of Naira and high inflation rate in the country. We have put all the blame about exchange rate on Central Bank. Mm. The truth is that Central Bank should not even take up to 20% of that blame. Mm. The entire blame should be on many other areas of the country. Mm. One of the areas is the same insecurity in the country we're talking about. Another area is the physical side of our economy, which is the, 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 the way managed by another a ministry, mm. Ministry of Finance. Mm. Um, what CBN is trying to do is just to be able to um, try to, it's just to be able to manage the kind of um, revenue base we have and the kind of inflows of foreign exchange we have and use it to make decisions of monetary policy. Otherwise, CBN should not take up to 20% of the blame mm. of why our um, exchange rate is this way. Mm. Yeah, because there are many other factors responsible for where we are today. 
One factor is the fact that our revenue base is almost uh, low, very, very low. Um, uh, we remain having our revenue base with uh, oil. Um, when we can actually generate a lot of revenue from other sectors. Now, um, one thing everybody should ponder, um, or everybody should ponder about is the fact that oil is contributing um, up to 90% of our revenue base, um, yet it's not contributing up to 50% of our GDP. Other sectors are contributing up to 50, up to 80% of our GDP. Yet, those other sectors that are contributing 80% of our GDP are not contributing to our revenue base. So, it's a thing to worry and a thing to start asking questions. If oil that is contributing 10% or more, slightly above 10% of our revenue base mm -hmm. is contributing far less to GDP mm -hmm. and others are contributing more to GDP but well, less to revenue, there is something going wrong that we need to correct. If we can correct that, our revenue base will increase. Nigeria and President Mohamed Buhari has taken over the presidency of the Agency for the Great Green Wall, PAGGW, in Africa for the next two years. This is made known to newsmen by the Minister of State for Environment, Chief Sharon Ikbiazo, at the end of the fourth ordinary session of the Conference of Heads of State and Government of the Pan-African Agency for the Great Green Wall in Abuja. Ikbiazo expressed optimism that the unparalleled commitment of President Buhari on addressing issues of climate change and the certification, coupled with the immense respect he commands within the international community, a lot will be achieved during his tenure. She also stated that in his acceptance speech of the PAGGW leadership, President Buhari stated that all things being equal, Nigeria will strengthen efforts in mobilization of resources for the accelerated accomplishment of the Decennial Priority Investment Plan 2021-2030 and its concrete implementation action. And on the foreign scene, several people are wounded after Myanmar security forces rammed a car into an anti-coup protest in Yangon. Details of this and others, foreign news. Several people are wounded after Myanmar security forces rammed a car into an anti-coup protest in Yangon. Sunday's protest is one of at least three held in Yangon, Myanmar's biggest city, and similar rallies are reported in other parts of the country a day ahead of an expected verdict in the first of several criminal cases against the country's civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi, who was toppled in a military takeover on February 1. Anti-military protests are continuing despite the killing of more than 1,300 people since the coup. The scattered protests are often small groups voicing opposition to the overthrow of Suu Kyi's elected government and the return of military rule. The death toll following the eruption of Indonesia's Semiru volcano has risen to 14, as rescuers continue to set villages blanketed in molten ash for survivors. In a statement on Sunday, a spokesman for Indonesia's Disaster Mitigation Agency, BNPB, Abdul Muhari, said two of the 14 people killed by the eruption have been identified. He said at least 98 people are injured, including two pregnant women, while 902 people have been evacuated from the villages surrounding Semeru in the east of Java province. The volcano, located on Indonesia's most densely populated island of Java, erupted on Saturday, spewing columns of ash more than 12 kilometers into the sky and sending searing gas and lava flowing down its slopes. The BNPB says it sent aid to shelters including food, trampolines, face masks and body bags. Iran says a loud explosion that was heard near its nuclear facilities in Natanz, which have previously been targeted by sabotage attacks, is part of a controlled test. The test is part of drills that are regularly carried out under supervision from local air defense authorities. No damages were said to be incurred to the local area as part of the test. The incident comes as Israel has repeatedly threatened Iran with military action, pledging not to allow Iran to obtain nuclear weapons. Iran has blamed Israel for two attacks on Natanz facility. Top Israeli officials renewed their threats against Iran last week when Iran and the world powers party to its 2015 nuclear deal reconvened in Vienna in an effort to restore the accord that the United States unilaterally abandoned in 2018. Sudan's military chief, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, says the army will leave politics after elections that are scheduled for 2023. Al-Burhan offered the assurance during the weekend.
The general had led a military takeover in late October, leading to Sudan's transition to civilian-led democracy. But a deal struck on November 21 has reinstated Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok to lead a technocratic cabinet until elections in July 2023. The coup which ended a partnership with civilian political parties after the toppling of long-time ruler Omar al-Bashir drew international condemnation after the detention of dozens of key officials and crackdowns on protesters. Neighborhood resistance committees and political parties have called on military to exit politics immediately and have rejected any compromise, including the deal with Hamdok. And finally, the United States, the European Union and 20 other countries have condemned the Taliban over allegations of summary killings of former police and intelligence officers in Afghanistan. The statement comes after Human Rights Watch, HRW, published a report documenting the killing or disappearance of at least 47 members of the Afghan National Security Forces. The country said they are deeply concerned by the allegations and underlined that the alleged actions constitute serious human rights abuses and contradicts the Taliban's announced amnesty for former Afghan officials. They called on the Taliban to effectively enforce the amnesty for former members of the Afghan security forces and former government officials to ensure that it is upheld across the country. And in sports news, Ralph Ragnick's reign at Manchester United got off to a winning start thanks to a stunning strike from much aligned Fred, striker Fred. A brief Crystal Palace 1-0 at Old Trafford on Sunday. A bright start from the Red Devils fizzled out without a reward and the German looked like he might have to settle for a disappointing draw in his first match since taking charge until the end of the season. But Fred, who had been a target for much of the criticism towards the end of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's time as manager, produced a moment of magic with a curling effort on his weaker right foot 13 minutes from time to snatch a crucial victory. United moved back to within three points of the top four and up the sixth on the Premier League table. There, are no immediate, there were no immediate changes from Nagnik in the lineup as he named an unchanged side from Thursday's 3 2 win over Arsenal. Niger State Governor Abubakar Sani Bellu has sympathized with the people of Wushishi local government, Kwantogore Emirate, and the entire Nigerites over the death of elder statesman General Muhammad Inwa Wushishi retired. Governor Sani Bellu, in a condolence message signed by Chief Press Secretary Mary Noel, describes the general as a gentleman, father, soldier, and an administrator of high ethics and impeccable morality. The governor maintained that even after active service, late General Wushishi had continued to offer useful counsel that helped in the development of the society, adding that his demise creates a vacuum that can only be filled by Allah. Governor Bello prayed to Allah to forgive the shortcomings of the deceased and grant him al fit dose, as well as give the entire people of the state and close associates the fortitude to bear the great loss. Similarly, the Registrar National Examination Council, Professor Anthony Wushishi, had described the death of General Muhammad Inwa Wushishi as a great loss to the people of Wushishi and the Niger state in general. Professor Wushishi, in a statement by Aziz Saini, Head of Information and Public Relations Division, described the late elder statesman as a quintessential leader whose footprints will remain indelible in the sand of time. And before we end the news, here is a quick kicker. 18-year-old artificial intelligence whiz Mercy Samson's robotic prototypes has wowed Nigeria. Now she wants Africa to focus on artificial intelligence and the opportunities provided by the fourth industrial revolution. Meanwhile, she also has a personal point to prove. She is a deaf person living in a country where that is a problem. Let's take a look. During coronavirus, I made a project of hand sanitizer so people do not have to touch to spread the disease.
she is a critical thinker she is very observant and her passion really motivates me we have made in scratch made animations fish animations driving animations games back and forth many things science is not for the deaf this is what we have been fighting you know for ages to today i've not seen a deaf school where they offer science class in fact in, in the few inclusive schools we have to really battle And with that, we wrap up Trust TV News Hour for tonight. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us across all our social media platforms. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Thanks for watching.